I'm a community planner uh, with the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program of the National Park Service. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is talk with you a little bit about what that program is uh, and how we work with uh, local partners and communities across the Midwest. Uh, so the mission of the National Park Service, and this is the federal agency like the Grand Canyon, that, that National Park Service, our mission is to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources of the nation, as well as cooperate with partners to extend the benefits of outdoor recreation and the natural and cultural resource conservation throughout the world. Uh, so we are actually a government agency with a worldwide mission uh, and not just focus on our park boundaries. But when people think of the National Park Service, oftentimes they tend to think of that first sentence of our mission statement. And so they think of places like Glacier National Park, uh, which is what you can see on your screen right now, or maybe a little bit closer to home, they think of Indiana Dunes National Park, or maybe even Pullman National Monument uh, here in Chicago on the south side. But what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna challenge you that when you think of the National Park Service, think of places like the Hegwish community in Chicago on the southeast side and places like the Calumet River uh, and things like the Ewing Avenue Bridge. Uh, this is a project site uh, for one of the initiatives that we are partnering with and assisting here in Chicago. And so when you think of the National Park Service, the Grand Canyon is a, a very wonderful you know, part of the national park system, but places like this on the Southeast side of Chicago are very much part of the National Park Service mission as well. So the community assistance program that I work for is called Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. And essentially, we are one of 54 different community assistance programs that the National Park Service has. These are things like the National Register of Historic Places or the Land and Water Conservation Fund that helps state governments do land acquisition uh, or state park planning. Uh, but our program is a, essentially a team of advisors that provide technical assistance to local partners that are planning outdoor recreation or natural resource conservation projects in local communities. So we take the ideals of the National Park Service and we bring them to your neighborhood, uh, even if you don't happen to live anywhere near a national park. We have about nine staff in the Midwest team uh, that provide assistance to 13 different states within our region. So uh, we have a small team, uh, but we do the best we can with the resources that we have. Uh, right now, I'm the primary project manager for the state of Illinois, the western half of the state of Indiana, and at the moment providing continuity to a few projects in Michigan, and then one in Iowa as well. Uh, but from these different field offices, we provide support to our local partners. Uh, and while some of my colleagues are based at national park sites, like our regional headquarters in Omaha or Cuyahoga Valley National Park uh, in Ohio, one of the unique aspects about the RTCA program is that we are very much embedded in local communities. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, I work here at the Great Cities Institute at UIC. Uh, my colleague in our Missouri field office works at the University of Missouri. Uh, and my colleague in uh, Wisconsin works at the regional office for the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, we have colleagues across the country that are based in local nonprofits, so sometimes not even a government entity, and some of which actually share office locations with state government agencies as well. But from these locations, we provide support to our partners across the Midwest. Typically, our staff are either community planners, landscape architects, or outdoor recreation planners. And then we also have a couple fellows that work for our program uh, and you'll be hearing from Natalie in a few minutes. So our strategic plan uh, for the RTCA program mandates us to provide assistance in five major categories of projects. And these are building healthy communities through parks, trails and outdoor opportunities, conserving natural lands, rivers and watersheds, engaging youth in outdoor recreation and stewardship, strengthening the organizational capacity of our project partners, and then supporting the National Park Service and its community networks outside of our national park boundaries. So in order to do that, uh, we take on a variety of different roles uh, for several different projects. Uh, most of my projects tend to focus on multi-use trail planning. 
So bike trails or running trails uh, or ways to connect different communities to regional trail systems, or they focus on river access planning. So where can we build canoe kayak launches and how can we make it easier for people to recreate on waterways uh, or green space or open space planning, everything from a large landscape level of how do we connect thousands of acres of public lands to local communities, or even how do we create just community focused green space like pollinator gardens. So in supporting those types of projects, again, the two main things we focus on are outdoor recreation or natural resource conservation. Uh, we provide a variety of different services to our local partners. And you can see some of those on this slide right here. Uh, most of my projects tend to focus on strategic planning, project management, or community outreach and engagement. And community outreach and engagement is one of, I believe, the hallmarks of the RTCA program and one of the things that we do best. Uh, oftentimes we can step into a project as kind of like a neutral third party entity that really doesn't have a stake in the overall goal. And so we can facilitate conversations between project planners and local residents or stakeholder groups that might in some way be impacted by a trail coming in their nearby neighborhood or a park planning project that's kind of down the road. And so these are some of the different services we can provide uh, to local partners. And we work with uh, everything ranging from uh, federal agencies uh, to state government partners, to local government, to nonprofit organizations like the Nature Conservancy, uh, and even just kind of very informal loose community groups, uh, like a bunch of residents who wanna make their block a little bit better and create opportunities for you know, urban trees uh, and urban tree canopy or green space in their neighborhood. We are a resource for that entire range of local partners. And so what I'm gonna do right now is talk about a few of the projects that I'm currently supporting, just as a way of giving everyone a sense of uh, what type of role we play and who the partners are that we work with. So the first one I'm gonna talk about uh, is a project we're currently supporting with the US Forest Service in Michigan. Uh, right now, we are currently working with uh, some contacts at Huron Manistee National Forest, uh, which kind of spans the entire state um, but what it is, is in addition to the U.S. Forest Service's primary mission of timber, uh, there are also some really great opportunities for outdoor recreation in our national forests. I would actually argue that in some ways there is much of a destination for outdoor recreation as some of our national parks. And so here on Manistee is a great example of that. This is the Pierre Marquette National Scenic River uh, that runs through part of the national forest. Uh, there's some wonderful opportunities for outdoor recreation. Uh, this is a photo of Gleason's Landing, which is a campsite in the National Forest and also uh, one of the access points for canoeing or kayaking on the Père Marquette National Scenic River. Uh, one of the problems that's kind of come to light lately due to the pandemic is that a lot of our public lands are getting loved to death right now. Uh, this is a photo of what someone would encounter trying to get to the trailhead at a local hiking trail in Huron Manistee National Forest. So uh, these days on popular weekends, you can't even get to the parking lot. Uh, people have to kind of park down the road just along the side in order to access some of the recreation opportunities. So what the forest leadership team at this national forest came to RTCA with is that they don't want to just react to the current short-term challenges that they're facing due to recreation opportunities or visitation. What they want to do is think 20 years into the future and plan ahead for what outdoor recreation would look like in this national forest based upon changes in demographics for the local community as well as the state of Michigan. What it could look like with changes in recreation trends. So if e-bikes or electric assist bikes are going to be a bigger thing, how does that impact their trail planning efforts for where people can go to in the forest? If that extends the range of someone's you know, normal morning trip to go biking, how do they plan for that? Or how do, can they take into consideration a shorter season for snowmobile trails due to warmer winters uh, and there not being as much snow on the ground for as much of the year? Uh, so right now we are facilitating some discussions with the Forest Service staff, as well as uh, later this week, we're hosting a workshop with about 40 different partner groups throughout the state of Michigan. And what we're gonna do is come up with a series of recommendations that we can bring to the forest leadership team for them to identify, you know, what do we want to plan for in 20 years? And what do we want recreation to look like in our national forest in 20 years? 
Uh, so this is an example of us coming in as a facilitator to kind of help with community outreach and engagement and develop a set of strategic planning goals. Another project we're working on in Princeton, Iowa. Uh, Princeton is a community of about 400 people uh, located a little bit north of the Quad Cities, so the Rock Island, Davenport area. And this is a view of uh, pretty much from someone's front yard. This is from Google Maps, but there are a couple of communities uh, or neighborhoods that have houses where this is their, this is their view. This is the Mississippi River. Uh, Princeton is located right on the river. And what they would want to do is they're trying to extend the Mississippi River Trail, which is a multi-use bike uh, and pedestrian trail from LeClaire, Iowa, which is maybe about 10 miles south of them through their community of Princeton. And so they approached the RTCA program and said, hey, we've got some local partners and a small neighborhood nonprofit that wants to you know, improve local connections and bring this great opportunity up to our community. Can you help us kind of figure out what that trail proposal would look like? And can you help us come up with ideas for how to improve some of the local parks in our neighborhood? Uh, this stretch uh, adjacent to River Road, that green space you can see, some of the, this kind of runs for an entire, I would say mile or so along the river. And some of these are privately owned as extensions of the residential homes that would be uh, behind you if this is the view you're looking at. And some of this green space is actually owned by the city as pocket parks. But oftentimes you can't tell where the private property ends and where the, uh, the pocket park begins. And so we're working with some partners in the landscape architecture department at Iowa State University to come up with some trail plans and renderings, trail extension, uh, and then kind of improved community green space could potentially look like. And so this is a student project right now where she's taking about seven sites along the Mississippi River and coming up with some renderings for how the community can activate these spaces. So they're not just empty lots or grass that people don't know is open to the public. Uh, and so we're in the process of taking this initial set of recommendations out to the community next week for a series of virtual community workshops. A little bit closer to home here in Chicago, uh, we're actually working with the staff at UIC's Great Cities Institute uh, for a planning project to identify green space opportunities uh, that give residents uh, better access to the Calumet River to enjoy for passive recreation and also just community green space. And so this is the same river uh, that I showed earlier when I challenged everyone that when you think of the National Park Service, think of places beyond you know, the Grand Canyon or Indiana Dunes. Uh, this is a little bit closer to Lake Michigan, uh, but we're working with the staff at GCI and Natalie's gonna talk a little bit later about what we're doing for this particular site. Uh, and then finally, uh, while we are the uh, local community assistance aspect of the National Park Service, occasionally we do work with our national park partners. One thing we're currently doing is working with the superintendent at Pullman National Monument on the south side. Uh, and if I can give everyone my recommendation for your post pandemic bucket list, uh, once things are back to normal and you're comfortable getting out, a trip to Pullman should be on your to-do list for later this summer and early this fall. The new brand new visitor center is set to open in September. Uh, this is the city of Chicago's first national formal national park site. Uh, this is going to be a great amenity for both the city and the south side. Uh, but part of the broader planning effort for the community recommendation from the National Park Conservation Association to establish a series of community green space uh, spaces that are linked between North Pullman and South Pullman on both sides of the, the new monument, uh, utilizing some city owned vacant space or other parcels that are just kind of there but not really utilized all that much. So thankfully we have a group of UIC undergrads in the Department of Urban Studies, who as part of their senior capstone project right now is actually doing an existing conditions analysis for us for a couple of these different parcels. And they're going to provide at the end of the semester, a list of recommendations for uh, which of these sites we should prioritize as part of a broader set of community outreach later this summer. Our office is going to be hosting an intern through the NPS Historically Black Colleges and Universities program, uh, where we're going to hire an intern for six months who's going to be embedded in the Pullman community, uh, spending two months doing an intense uh, project focused on community outreach and engagement to talk to local residents and local businesses and stakeholders about 
you know, there are these underutilized assets and resources in your community. And would you like to see these made into pollinator gardens or community green space, or just a place where we can put up like, um, you know, some planting beds or benches just for people to relax and be able to enjoy the outdoors in a little bit formal uh, and planned manner. So this is something we'll be working on later this summer. So hopefully these projects sound interesting to you. This is only a small of some of the things that our team is working on. Uh, and thankfully we have some help uh, that can provide some added capacity to our team. Uh, and two of the, one of the ways we do this is through these two fellows that are currently working with me this year. That is Natalie Burgos on the left uh, and Faith Welty, who is a landscape architecture fellow with our program based in West Lafayette, Indiana. And so Natalie and Faith, uh, pretty much I treat them as full federal employees as part of our program. I wouldn't be able to do my job without them. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Natalie and she's gonna talk a little bit about her fellowship with the Hispanic Access Foundation and some of the projects we're working on. So uh, Natalie, with that, take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so as Mike said, my name is Natalie Burgos and I'm the current Urban Ecology Fellow for RTCA. And what that means is well, I provide an ecological perspective to as many RTCA projects as I can get my hand on and provide a few extra helping hands to uh, local partners, to other projects that are across the country and anything that might need a little bit more of an insight from the environment. So uh, the way that I got connected to RTCA is through the Hispanic Access Foundation, specifically their MANO project, which aims at connecting uh, Latino and Hispanic students, recent graduates, young professionals to different opportunities within the federal government, especially NPS. So one of the projects that um, I'm working that I worked on that at the moment, it's more of an envisioning rather than a full project, but the goal of these renderings that I created is to see if we can get some excitement behind it and eventually a project might come of it. So up north in Schiller Woods, there are some um, mounds that one of the local groups created called the Serpent Mounds. And what we wanted to do was recreate that and tie in some environmentally supportive and um, promotion pieces, I guess you could say. Uh, in one of the parking lots for Schiller Woods, there's a nice big open space that's honestly just lawn. So I created these renderings to show how you could imitate the serpent mounds by uh, setting up some plantings. But not only that, you could promote water retention, pollinators, etc., using local native plants that would not only give the area a nice view, but would also ecologically help the area as well. Another project that we have worked on that is in the works is Canal Shores. It's a golf course up north in Evanston. And though this might not be the most flattering picture from the hazy day and whatnot, this is the current status of the golf course. And there in the back, you can see a bunch of shrubbery and trees and whatnot. And if we go to the next picture, then you'll see that it's kind of bare and whatnot. And looking closer, most of that is buckthorn and honeysuckle, which are some very difficult invasives to deal with. So the golf course wanted to make this space more than just a golf course. They wanted to add some ecology projects. They wanted to have people involved, not just in the game, but in nature itself. So what I did is I looked specifically at these banks and the channel that cuts through the center of the property. And I created these renderings based off of not just what it looks like, but what it could look like if you set it up with a native planting system. Over on, well, a little in both images, but more so on the left one, you can see how I divided each section based on the elevation and the slope on how it could be divided into a wetland, uh, woodland, or upland prairie savanna type ecosystem, which would not just help stabilize that and make it look nice. It bring in a lot of different species, not just of plants, but of animals as well that people could come and see and realize, hey, this stuff lives here too. Two other projects that I've got going on with RTCA is the one that Mike mentioned, the 100th Street project that Faith and I are working on creating renderings and getting something a bit more visual going. But there we hope to establish not just 
public access, but again, public space for people to enjoy nature with native plants, native animals, and also educate people that, yes, even in a very urban area, this can grow. There's always that picture that you see with the inspirational writing of concrete, but a rose miraculously growing through it. We want to help that along and not just hope that one day we come across that. The other project is in Iowa, the Des Moines Urban Wildlife Conservation Partnership. And this is a group of five organizations, the City of Des Moines, the Polk County Conservation District, Department of Natural Resources from Iowa, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And they initially came together to try and promote each other's individual conservation partnerships, projects, sorry. But now that we've worked with them and they've gotten to know each other a little more and their goals, it's become more of, hey, not only can we promote our individual projects here and there, but we can connect these projects to make it a bigger, more comprehensive conservation effort, which is, would be great for large landscape conservation. So this is another project and another visual that I worked on where I didn't wanna just show where our TCA is, but some of the projects that we put there with before and after pictures to just give people an idea of, hey, yeah, it's not just that we say that there are these projects that you can't really see, but you can actually go and visit them. Next, please. So aside from RTCA, I do have the three partner organizations that were mentioned earlier, Friends of the Chicago River being the first one. And with all of the groups, but especially with friends, I did anything and everything that they needed a hand with. And that included water testing, as you can see, which was set up alongside the parking lot. Um, I've also helped with collecting research and data for their Chicago Watershed Council and um, literature reviews to go through to see what methods are out there for restoring riparian corridors, which is the green space next to a river in urban cities. So speaking of data and research, um, I did help with friends, but I've also helped several other groups and people with research. So in the Midwest, you can see a bunch of colors because I've helped several groups. I've helped with RTCA, but um, over West, you can see in Idaho, I had a project with a researcher at the Bureau of Land Management looking at management methods for wild horses and burros. Down South in Texas, I was able to connect and start a um, conversation between tick research, which not that pleasant, but I was able to connect that with the chief of epidemiology from the Department of the Interior. And in Florida, one of the partners that I'll be talking about next is the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And I'm helping out with photo tagging down in Florida. And then for some reason, Canada and Germany are highlighted as well. And that's because with Friends of the Chicago River, I was able to connect with um, researchers and professors in both of those places who are also interested in not just learning how different places are looking at restoring riparian corridors, but how they're doing it with specific ecosystems and specific climate, which all plays into one another. And we'll see if something can come out of it that's not just for Chicago, but it can help other places as well. So as I mentioned, the Urban Wildlife Information Network, that is a project created by the Urban Wildlife Institute from Lincoln Park Zoo, where they've got a bunch of camera traps set out in different locations throughout Chicago. And so since they set up in lines kind of stemming from one central location out further north and west and a little bit south, we wanna see, okay, is there a pattern to the animal species that we do or don't see? And could that have any impact on what that means on urban sprawl or on the resilience of animals learning to adapt to urban environments? So we've got Lincoln Park Zoo coyotes in this one and the next picture. For some reason, they're always really interested in the little tag that gets put on the tree opposite of the camera. And then, as I mentioned earlier, further south in Florida, we've got the Central Florida Zoo. And you can get a variety of pictures that are either really, really crisp, clean, and dramatic like this one, or some that are really fuzzy and you're not totally sure if it's a coyote or a ghost. We also get invasive species such as wild boars down in Florida, which those are going to be important to track too if we ever want to maybe get a handle on them. Next. So one more project that's up north in Michigan is the Shiawassee Greenpoint Nature Reserve. And this was a two-pronged project. 
On one side, I work with Faith to create renderings for a nature-based playground and play space where it's not just a steel and metal plastic playground, but incorporating nature so that kids realize, hey, you can enjoy nature and have fun in it as well. So we created some renderings based off of that. And I created a rendering of a path where there would be raised beds alongside that would show either the succession and evolution of plants in an area, how they kind of take over from moss to giant trees, or the impact of invasive species versus native species. So people can kind of walk along and see, oh, even though it's this one plant at first that's not supposed to be here, it can grow into a problem. Whereas the native species that we've got can create something beautiful. Uh, the other side of that was uh, these maps and signs, which if you're going to restore the entire area, people are going to be curious as to why, especially because not everyone knows that sometimes you do need bulldozers and chainsaws. And a lot to a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. Why are you chainsawing trees if they're nature, right? Well, I worked on this project to try and educate people so that they know, hey, we need to take these out so that natives can grow back or so that we can restore the hydrology of the area. And as you can see, it went through multiple iterations and phases of do we want to show it year by year, by project type, etc. But the bottom right is what we think is most helpful for everyone to see. And that way people will learn, hey, this is what it could look like and why it's going to be a good thing after. And the last chunk of projects, I know it's a lot, is uh, PLC projects, which are public land core, uh, core projects. And these are projects where I helped mostly with research, that horse and burro research that I mentioned earlier, that was one of these projects. And this other one was creating a story map that would work as a database where all the research done on piping plovers, which is an endangered shorebird, um, would be grouped together and could also be shown to the public in a way that makes sense and isn't just an Excel sheet. So for Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, I looked through plenty of these pictures of fortunately very cute little birds, as well as, next slide, a bunch of other species that could impact them and the native plants that are in the area. So after going through all those, this is what came about, which is a story map where it's a very cool tool for public outreach because you can not only show information like on the maps on the next slide, but people can also interact with them. And there are little tidbits of, hey, this is what this map means and this is why it's significant, like on the next slide. And so after going over, okay, this is what their lifestyle is like. And on the next slide, we've got images of people and the way that they're helping and helping release and tag these birds so that we can keep track of them and figure out how they're doing. Next one. We can get people to understand what the life of these birds are like and hopefully more interested in them, including the predators and threats that they face, even those that we can't necessarily control like um, botulism E toxicity. Last one. And of course, got to finish with Montine Rose who are our local piping plovers that are up on Montrose Beach, hence their names, it, to give people a little bit of hope that, yeah, sometimes things can go a little bit wrong, but that doesn't mean we can't do something about it. All right, thanks, Natalie. Uh, so uh, this was quite a few projects that we shared with you today. Uh, I promise you this is only a very, very small snapshot uh, of the work that the Midwest Rivers Trails and Conservation Assistance Program is doing across the region. Uh, and for a lot of the projects that Natalie and I talked about uh, and some of the other ones in Illinois, uh, a lot of the work that went into supporting these partners, uh, all of the stakeholder meetings, all of the planning workshops, all of the conversations and emails, a lot of that work over the past five years happened on the fourth floor of Cuppa Hall at the Great Cities Institute. Uh, so without them, I don't think we would be able to have provided the level of support that we have for all of our partners here in Chicago. So uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to, to Teresa and the staff there uh, for this wonderful partnership opportunity that allows the National Park Service uh, to work at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, and be here in Chicago. Uh, so with that, I always like to end with this image on this slide because I think that phrase does a good job of conveying the mission 
of the Nash, of the RTCA program. Uh, if it's a little bit small for you, the text says there are parks everyone should see someday, and a few you could stop by this afternoon. And here in the RTCA program, uh, we like to help local communities create those wonderful parks and recreation opportunities that everybody could go to this afternoon.